Welcome, guys, and thank you for joining us for the first ever episode of our new podcast, The Exposed Negative. This week, we're going to be discussing issues that face professional photographers, such as keeping busy during quiet periods, something I can imagine we are all aware of right now. We are joined by commercial and lifestyle photographer Julian Love, who's going to be discussing with us, amongst other things, how he shoots and produces large-scale personal projects and tips on how to get commissioned to shoot the things that you really want to be shooting. Well, well, well. Welcome to the new podcast. How are you doing, Tom? I'm doing all right, my friend. How are you doing? Not too bad. Not too bad. Um, to our listeners, you are listening to uh, Greg Fennell and Tom Barnes. Uh, it's, actually, the- it's actually Barnes. <laughs> uh, for anyone who didn't hear that originally i completely cocked up greg's name and i've known greg now a couple of years and i genuinely have been pronouncing his name wrong turns out since day one which he has just corrected me on off air so uh <laughs> hi it's hi greg very, Cornell. very much doing? a uk bucket thing uh <laughs> i get no end of chip for it i can but imagine I like my name being spelled properly <laughs> <laughs> do you want to tell the ladies and gents why we have decided to start a podcast well apart from the fact that we're sat at home doing nothing <laughs> apart from apart from that quite key apart from that quite key fact that both, both of us have suddenly found ourselves with a bit more time on our hands i think i mean yeah in all honesty um we both felt that the um we were kind of looking for a podcast and we wanted a podcast that uh, dealt with professional photographers working in the industry um, in the kind of commercial sector. And there's, there's, you know, don't get me wrong, there's loads of great podcasts out there and there's loads of great photography podcasts out there. Um, but we felt there was a little bit of a gap in the market and something that we ourselves would want to listen to. So rather selfishly, we decided, well, why don't we just <laughs> make one? I mean, I very much like hearing myself pretty much all the time. So this is going to be wonderful for me to listen to on loop. <laughs> we basically both just wanted to be DJs, I think. That's it. <laughs> the, the, the DJ. <laughs> um, so we've, yeah, we, what we've tried to do in the, in the kind of the coming week. So we, we are going to be interviewing professional commercial photographers across the industry. Um, predominantly going to be in the UK and Europe, but we will be stretching out to the US and reaching out to photographers over there as well because it will be interesting to see the similarities and differences in the way that we will work. And hopefully the nuggets of information that we will get will be interested, you know, interesting for not just other photographers, but for people who are kind of just starting out in the industry or people who are quite far along in the industry and just kind of want to know what other people are up to. Because quite honestly, it is, um, it can be quite a solitary profession at times. And, um, Hopefully, this is a way to just kind of open some of those doors and to, um, you know, make more of a community. I think that's the plan. I think, you know, like you say, it's being, a, you know, often most photographers are tend to be lone wolves. So a lot of us work from home. So I know you, uh, you don't actually work from home, do you? You actually work from a studio. Yeah, so I have a studio in South London that I work from. And, I mean, I'm not working there at the moment because... Uh, I don't worry. I'd get arrested if I went there. Yeah, on. <laughs> no one is. <laughs> but um, so I've hastily reset up at home. But uh, ultimately, for me, working from the studio, I mean, it's everyone has different approaches to this, and I know that you do. Uh, to me, but for, for me personally, working from the studio has always been. Um, I've worked from that studio for about seven or eight years now. I share it with uh, at the moment. There's five other photographers in my particular studio. We all shoot different types of work. And for me, it's a great way to have a community, to have people to run ideas past, to kind of be able to discuss stuff with. Um, and also it kind of forces me to treat the work as a, a nine to five. I found that when I was working from home, I found it difficult to kind of know a cutoff period. And I found that sometimes clients could be a little bit uh, um, take for granted the fact that you can you know pick up an email at midnight and get them an edit for six in the morning <laughs> rather than actually going home like the we, rest of the people at six we've PM. all been there yeah it's tough, <laughs> it's tough that <laughs> but, i mean i'm very jealous of your setup because your setup from home is just something it's like if for the for the listeners i mean i wish you could see tom's setup because it is honestly it's like something out of star trek <laughs> over, over the years i have done so many blog posts for people like petapixel and stuff uh so i've i've created loads of desks and i've worked from home for so long that my desk has to be perfect 
And I have death envy. That's that's what it's like. Folks. Do you know what? I, I'm th- that's the plan. I don't care. Working from it's horrible, but as long as people get jealous, that's what that's what I'm into. <laughs> this man has has more drawers that you could shake a stick at. Um, I do uh, have drawers, fantastic. <laughs> um, I mean, looking at him now. I mean, obviously you can't see him, but I'll, I'll describe for the Des- viewers. Describe me, Greg. Describe me. <laughs> Whereas I'm on some terrible iMac kind of camera, Tom's actually beaming live via a Leica. What is it you're using? Le- there? Yeah, Leica SL2 as a webcam. So it is, it is completely overkill. I mean, it's probably a seven thousand pound setup that I've got to shoot me that's streaming over seven twenty over the web. But it does give me that lovely feel that is very hard to describe. You know that Leica look. <laughs> It, it it does look amazing. I'm, I'm yeah. It's a shame you guys at home can't see it. But, don't uh, worry. I'm sh- I'm sure at some point we'll probably turn this into a video podcast, and then we'll lose all our subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, mo- moving on to today's subject. Basically, we wanted to discuss the ideas behind kind of staying motivated and staying busy and productive and inspired. Really, when things get quiet now. We've both been probably, we're a similar age. I think we've both been shooting for a similar amount of time, which is coming up to about 15 years. You look considerably younger than me. And obviously you're much younger because you still leave your phone off silent. (laughs) (laughs) Busted. Um, (laughs) So we have, uh, yeah, we've been kind of working for the past 15 years in the industry. And obviously during that time, you get, you're going to go through periods when you are, busy and you're going to go through periods when you're quiet and when when the going's you know good and is busy it it can be almost incredibly stressfully busy um you can be it can be difficult on kind of family life and you you know having to drop everything and get on a plane and go fly somewhere and you know all the the fun and games that come with the job um but equally you go through periods when it gets quiet and to be able to survive in this industry it's kind of you have to treat it as a marathon not a race you've got to be able to keep self-motivated, but also enjoy the times when it is a little bit quieter and use them to, you know, be productive in certain ways. And at the same time, avoid burnout. I think with a lot of people, when they get quiet, they start panicking. And they think they suddenly go, oh my God, there's no work coming in. You kind of go, well, look, dude, you've been busy for like seven or eight months. Like, just chill out. Enjoy this time. Learn some new techniques. Just relax. Do some marketing. Catch up. Schedule your socials, whatever. I think yeah. people need to learn that, you know, actually the, the quiet times can be as useful as when you're being really busy. Granted, they might not bring you as much money, but there is much more to life. And I'm sure, you know, without being funny, if you wanted money, you go into banking. You probably wouldn't choose photography. Well, for me, it's one of the perks of the job. And it's one of the reasons why I've kind of picked it as a career is, is the ability to actually choose whether or not you want to be kind of working and busy and being able to take time off because it is time is one of those rare luxuries that no one can actually buy and most people want more of it and if you can find a way to give yourself time every now and again to do what you want to be doing then that's that's fantastic so i think it's important to to bear that in mind i mean with the current situation i think perhaps <laughs> that's been flipped on its head and everyone's got a bit more time than they really want on their hands everyone's starting podcasts <laughs> indeed got my yeah my youtube channel starting up so yeah, i mean we're, we're all finding ways to to maintain um levels of productivity i guess um but it is something that is worth discussing, and we do discuss it in our uh, interview with Julian today. And he's, I think a, he's, he's a very lovely chap. Oh, he's great. Very, very yeah. lovely chap. Jules is one of those incredibly um, pleasant and eloquent kind of photographers who, I, as soon as we kind of were thinking about who we wanted to talk to for our Maiden episode, he came to mind because I thought, safe pair of hands. <laughs> So I just thought he'd be gentle. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he um he talked about a few things such as personal projects, and I know it's something that you do a lot of as well, Tom. With these mm-hmm. kind of you've you've been doing quite a few big personal projects recently over in Indonesia and South Korea, um, and yeah, I've I've done a few. I, I for the for the readers, listeners, re- re- viewers, yeah, whoever's listening, uh, I had <laughs> my wife had there? a. Yeah, my wife had a baby uh, a few months ago, so I knew I was going to have some quiet time with the family. So I basically spent the latter half of last year creating huge bodies of work, which are still unreleased because I've been so busy up until all of this kind of kicked off. 
So um, yeah, it was it was really interesting, kind of chatting to Julian, seeing how he how he does it. We do it in a similar but very different way. So mm. um, yeah, I, I think I would much prefer to do his way. His way sounds like far far more sensible use of time. <laughs> how do you how do you tend to find kind of inspiration when you're feeling in a bit of a a rut? Because let's let's face it, we I mean the whole kind of roller coaster thing is is a reality that you do come up and get, you have your ups and downs, and there are days when you just you don't want to look at your cameras, let alone pick them up, and that's just natural. And I think it's something that people don't necessarily always talk about, but I mean it's part of the process of any kind of creative process is you're going to have periods when you're really inspired and periods when you're not. But sometimes you have to kind of force yourself to be inspired. Yeah, so how, how do you do that? It's a tough one, isn't it? I don't think anyone ever talks about kind of, you know, when you're feeling kind of low or you're feeling kind of bummed out, like you don't really want to kind of, you know, put your face on and be like, yeah, what's up guys? Let's go and take pictures. Like it just, it's, it's tough, especially with some of the personal projects I've done. There's been a huge amount of prep work that goes into securing permissions and stuff. All that stuff's really boring to do. So to then like, you know, get kind of like G'd up about it is quite, it's surprisingly tough until you're mm. there and this, this is how i kind of do it i basically as soon as the camera comes out of the bag as soon as the handshake goes goes well not a handshake obviously as soon as everyone says namaste and does the bow and or whatever we're doing these days um but the face comes on and I, i've just managed to compartmentalize anything that i was feeling kind of low and i just i just get on because you can't for me personally i don't allow myself to be low on shoots so, no you, you can't afford to be really I mean, no, it's, it's it's also that that sense that's a lot of photography. There's an element of performance in it, isn't there? You're putting on like a. Well, I think you've got, a hat. yeah, I think you've almost got to be the, the the most fun guy in the room, haven't you? I mean, everyone's got to be able to come to you and get the answers. And I what you're shooting, I mean, yeah, of course, yeah. Obviously, every you know everything's different. Other work at a funeral. Uh, well, do you know I was a very good fun at a funeral. You know, I did actually get years ago. I got asked to shoot one. And I was a bit wow. like, oh. that would be a niche. Yeah. I know. You imagine me rolling in with my assistants and lighting into a funeral. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a tough one. I, I feel like we do, we do manage to put on a face, but for me, when I'm, when I'm kind of feeling kind of like unmotivated and kind of uninspired, I will hopefully it tends to come when I'm quiet. Mm. So I do kind of, I go on my website and I go, right. Because I I'm I'm I don't tend to take a ton of inspiration. I don't tend to spend ton, tons of time scrolling through social media. I have a lovely collection of photo books and stuff, which you know I know we're going to talk about in a minute. But for for me, the I I look at my work and go, well, I don't like that now. Why don't I like it? Actually, I really like that part of that image. Maybe if I could then do that differently. And so I kind of get cross with myself over previous work in a way, and it kind yeah. of it lights a bit of a fire. And I'm one of these guys that when I have a fire lit underneath me, like that's a huge driving force for me personally. What about yeah. you? I think, I mean, it's similar in a way, although I find that I do, I do look through a lot of social media, but I'm always a bit wary of it because I feel like it can go two ways. You can either kind of be looking at it and thinking, yes, this is great. This has really inspired me. Or you can start to beat yourself up. Mm -hmm. um i think photo books are a good way to do it if you've got the luxury uh, to have you know the space to have a good book collection i mean one of my favorite things to do is to have a cup of coffee in the morning and actually get a photo book off the shelf and and sit down and take the time to enjoy it i am um, as a studio we we um quite often will go to gallery shows we've the last couple of years we've been to Arles um uh festival in in france um you know try and do things to actually uh force that inspiration by seeing what other work is out there but not necessarily in a digital context because for me staring at a screen is never going to be the same as looking at a picture on a wall or in a book see that's interesting for me my work's the opposite i see a lot mainly most of my work on screens so I, yeah no, I i'm not saying i don't see it, the work on screen but i feel that the connection that I get from seeing work printed is always still for me a little bit stronger. And I think partly it's a design element that goes around it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the fact that you can touch it and, you know, you can feel the quality of the print and stuff like that. Yeah, it's no, almost that sense of owning something. 
Mm -hmm. as well like if you buy a book you know you feel like you've bought into it and you've you've got that and you'll always have it there's something more tangible about something physical than there is you know a uh, 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 image that you really like so you saved on your instagram or you've you know you've you've screenshotted so you've got it as a reference it never it feels cheap cheaper yeah no I, I get that especially if you have a print though you can't just you could obviously send prints out in the post and stuff but if you have an image on a on a phone and whatnot anyone can see that you know you've yeah. got this print in front of you there's a there's a kind of a these days a, a kind of a definitely a limited edition feel to oh yeah see it because you actually kind of go well actually what's the print run of this book it's fifteen thousand. Well, that's Indeed. only fifteen thousand of the images Indeed. And I think we've both got books in our collection that we've kind of, we've picked up and uh, have got a real special place for us. And they've, mm. there's that reverence that comes from that. So, Oh, I've, yeah. got, I've got so many limited editions and signed editions as well. I know there's only like, you know, 20 of these books and that for me makes them very, very special indeed. Mm. More so than a signed picture on a screen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what other, are there any other kind of things that you, before we kind of jump into chatting with Julian, is there anything else that, I mean, I, one of the other books that I mentioned actually in the, in the conversation, I think was, um, we talked about the, um, Magnum photo book, mm. um, and the, uh, photo book collection by Martin Parr, um, both of which are great because ultimately what they are are photo books books about photo books which mm -hmm. is quite meta um, but what's nice about it is you get a compilation so the magnum photo book um, we'll link to it in the show notes um and over on our um put a picture up of on the uh, instagram feed um the magnum photo book is by carol nagger and fred richin and the um the it's just called the photo book but it's a three volume collection which is uh, martin parr and jerry badger and it's basically um, a history of the photo book. And what's so fantastic about it is you can look through it and they've got kind of scans and pages from all of these photo books. So you can s get a sense of the design and the flow um, across a massive range of photographers and um, period of time. So it's a great, it's, uh, I love that book. Um, another one which I have, which is quite useful every now and again, just to flick into is the photographer's playbook. Mm -hmm. which has got 307 assignments and ideas one's um gregory halpin and jason fulford um and that's a good little book just to dip into if you're feeling a little bit um like you want a small personal project to start on um yeah it's a, it's a nice one that one it's nicely put together that book as well mm. it's not, i can't it's say not... i've ever actually managed to complete any of the assignments but... no, no neither have i it's, it's it gets pulled off the shelf a lot but that's about it. <laughs> so, should we speak to Julian? Yeah, I think that's probably probably good. All right. Well, here's here's Julian then. <laughs> so today we are talking to Julian Love. You can follow along with his work. It's julianlove.com. Uh, Julian, how are you doing? Yeah, good, thanks. Excellent. Whereabouts are you guys today? Uh, I'm in Deptford right now at home. Um, Excellent. Any uh, any new kind of additions to the office or anything like that, or are you are you now moving office? Well, yeah, I've actually uh, temporarily moved out of my regular office in Dalston and have a little home set up now. With got my big screen and my wind up desk, and uh, yeah, feeling pretty professional. Very nice, very nice. Do you want to uh, give us a kind of a brief overview of your your work and kind of maybe how you how you kind of got your got your start? Sure. Um, so I'm a uh, people and lifestyle photographer, and uh, I've been photographing about 15 years now. And uh, I started out as a travel photographer, really, as a, a sort of hobby that got out of control, uh, probably like a lot of people, um, mm -hmm. and started shooting for uh, magazines and guidebooks and tourist boards and that sort of thing uh, back in 2005. And then... From that, that led on to shooting for uh, hotels and resorts, uh, where I started to work uh, with uh, art directors and models and uh, started to use lighting and that sort of thing. And that led on to sort of more broader commercial lifestyle photography, I guess, which um, I've been doing for the last uh, eight years or so, I guess. And um, yeah, that's what I do now. Uh, so I shoot for all sorts of clients all over the world, 
and uh, got based here in London. Just have I got it right, uh, Jules? That um, you you studied what was it? You studied at university. You were at Oxford, right? So that's what's your right. typical yeah. kind of photography <laughs> starting point. Yeah, I didn't uh, study photography at all. I um, I studied human sciences uh, at university, um, and went in actually started a business career to begin with, and was a management consultant for seven years, and then uh, decided I wanted to do something a bit more fulfilling. Uh, for me anyway, and so I thought I'd give this photography lark a go, and uh, I gave myself a couple of years to try and make a success of it, and uh, here we are 15 years later, so I guess and, it worked out. And how does a photography career compare to something in management consultant in terms of, well... <laughs> <laughs> um, to some extent, uh, some things are the same, uh, or similar, surprisingly, in that um, consulting work is very much project based where you have to get your head around a brief understand what you need to, to deliver for a client and then uh, put together what you need to make that happen and uh, a lot of commercial photography is uh, similar to that um, and a lot of it is uh, is problem solving um, which we do a lot in photography as well um, we've all been there when we've turned up at a location and it's not quite been what we expected and we have to pull something out of the bag um, so uh, thinking on your feet is uh, something that consulting was a good uh, background for as well. And also um, probably uh, planning and structuring uh, your work, which I know I think is something we're going to come on to talk about a bit later, but that's something that I've definitely carried over from my uh, consulting background to my photography career. So um, yeah, there's maybe more, more things that overlap, more skills that overlap than uh, you might appear at first. Very nice. Very nice. So uh, we're going to talk kind of, we're going to kick kind of uh, this main thing off and just talk about your inspirations and kind of how you, how you find it. Is there anything, anything you kind of do in particular, you know, we all have our different kind of ways of, of, of finding things, you know, whether it's old books or social media and stuff like that. Is there anything like that you want to shoot or kind of find things that inspire you or is, is there anything that kind of really kind of, you know, fires you up to kind of get going and photograph new new work or new people or new situations. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think I think there's two halves to it. One is um, where I look for visual inspiration in terms of the stylistically how I want to shoot and the kind of look I would like my pictures to have. And for that, I'm not going to say anything new here. Really, it's uh, yeah, like you say, social media browsing websites, reading magazine articles, and you see things which catch your eye, and you think, oh, that was great, the way they did that, or the way somebody's used light, or the way somebody's composed a frame, or something like that. So, um, and I'm going to be honest here and say I'm not a fantastically original photographer. I'm quite probably quite derivative in the way that I shoot, but um, I definitely get inspiration from you know, seeing the work of others and these days, of course, Instagram's a fantastic way of exposing yourself to lots of different visual styles and try and understand how I integrate some of the things that I see that I really respond to kind of into my own work is something that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So I guess that can help you set a kind of visual direction for your work. But then you've got to think about, well, what are the, what are the subjects that I actually want to shoot though? What do I want to apply that visual style to? And I think that needs to be much more personal for everybody because ultimately it's got to be something that you're interested in mm -hmm. um, sure. to make sure that you're motivated enough to actually do it um, mm -hmm. and work hard at it and make a good job of it. So, and that's where you, I guess you, you can kind of absorb other aesthetic styles and put your own stamp on it is how you apply it in the, in the real world and find subjects that, you, that uh, inspire you to get out there and spend time and, and shoot them. Sure. Do you, do you, going back to the social media thing, do you ever find yourself kind of pressured or kind of wanting to kind of go against pressure to maybe fit in with any particular trends or anything like that? Or are you just kind of happy to just kind of create beautiful imagery? I guess ultimately, um, I just want to create beautiful imagery. <laughs> um, I think uh, I don't have a, a, a great motivation for my work beyond wanting to create something that is a aesthetically interesting and, and b hopefully for some of my personal work at least the subject matter is interesting as well mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I don't think I'm not looking for my photography to do anything more than that really 
Um, I know there are a lot of uh, a lot of other photographers out there who are where their photography is more meaningful than that, and mine, mine isn't, um, which is fine. I'm totally comfortable <laughs> with that. Um, you know, I'm not trying to change the world through my photographs, um, but hopefully I can, especially through my personal projects, create photographs that are uh, pleasing to look at and also interesting uh, in subject matter. Um, I guess we probably we can't go much further without mentioning the um, the giant virus elephant in the room at the moment which is the um covid19 pandemic which is currently what, going what's that, what's that gregor i've oh, not heard uh, anything about this yet <laughs> <laughs> um obviously one of the things we wanted to talk to you about was the idea of how you you know the i mean one thing i've always loved about you jules is the way that you motivate yourself to do a lot of test shoots and test projects um i really love the work that you shot last year out in la and that's not the first time that you've you've gone abroad and you've done a test shoot and you've produced them and set them up yourself. And I guess I wanted to ask really, um, because there's probably a lot of photographers right now trying to think, how do I, what do I do? What, how do I kind of create um, work for myself in this kind of fallow period? Now, normally for us, um, dry spells in work can happen at certain times of the year. And we kind of get used to perhaps filling in the time with with working on projects. Now, as somebody as somebody who who creates a lot of your own projects and test shoots, what would your kind of advice and what's your approach to that kind of thing? Yeah, I guess the the particular challenge at the moment is we're limited in the kinds of things we can shoot. So. Um, finding things that you can shoot around the home or finding people people or things you can shoot in your home. And I suppose it's different for different people, but as a sort of portrait and lifestyle photographer like I am, it's, um, it's particularly uh, difficult because I've only got one person I can photograph at the moment, and that's my wife. <laughs> um, and whilst she's a wonderful subject, there's only so many photographs she'll put up with. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so I've... Um, so I think you've got, got to make the most of what's around you a little bit in these times. I mean, uh, obviously the kind of photography I normally shoot is, uh, is involves lots of people often and, uh, and lots of different locations. And that's the kind of photography which I can't do right now. Um, so what I've been doing is trying to look at things I can photograph at home and what takes me into a slightly different space. And there are, I follow a number of studio based photographers um, on Instagram and I've been looking at the kind of work that they do and trying to think what of those I could do at home and as it happens there's a photographer with a home studio just down the street from me who's uh, offered to lend me a few C stands and backgrounds and um, so I'll be picking those up later this week and then experimenting a little bit uh, here, here at home with uh, a different kind of photography for me and yeah, very nice. that will um, yeah, that'll partly be, and I, I thought I might venture into a bit of still life as well as just uh, as well as portraiture. So we'll see, we'll see how that works out. But that's the intention. Nice. So aside from pandemic times, what normally kind of uh, kicks you into motivation? What's kind of the things, the factors that motivate you? Is it a mix of kind of seeing what other people are doing and feeling I could do that? I'm excited. That's kind of inspired me to go and work, or is it? Do you find projects that you you just uh, scratches that you need to itch, or how's your yeah. kind of motivational process? A bit of both. I do. I kind of think my personal shoots fall into two camps. Really, there are ones which I shoot, which are what I would call test shoots that are specifically for my lifestyle portfolio, like what I shot out in Los Angeles last year and in Cape Town the year before that, where. I'm very much looking to refresh my portfolio, bring in new material, shoot in a style of the kind of work that I want to attract. And then there are shoots that I do because I'm purely interested in the topic or the subject matter and I want to meet and photograph the people who work or operate in that world. And things like my Handmade London project and my Europeans project were out, came out of that, I guess. I mean that for me is one of the things that's wonderful about photography is it's such a it's such a fantastic excuse to go and meet people that you would normally maybe not have a chance to meet or to do things and to get access. It's a real passport into those worlds. 
Totally. I think, um, yeah, it is one of the great pros of a career in photography is the people and places you get to meet and things you get to learn. That's exactly the same for me. It's It's been, I, you know, I've got a career, well, I studied, similar to you, I studied something that was completely different to photography. I studied property economics. I don't think we, any of us studied photography, actually, did we? What did you study? History of war studies. Oh, there we go. Look at that. <laughs> uh, no, but at least you guys were kind of uh, photographing some, uh, no, learning some sort of like human history or or human sciences for me i was just going to try and make as much money as possible uh and, I'm, and then you became a photographer and i became a photographer i thought you know what i'll, I'll go the opposite way <laughs> um but yeah no it's um it's 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 fascinating uh, kind of the, the 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 level of access you get into these into these people's lives especially you know your your um your crafts project um you know these people are not used to being photographed they're probably not used to having many people in their space and they've kind of welcomed you with open arms. You can see it in your work. You've got obviously a really good repertoire with the subjects. So obviously you've got, you know, a great way of putting people at ease. Yeah, I think, um, I think to be a good photographer of people, you've got to be interested in people. And I find uh, researching a topic that I'm interested in, finding people who work in that space reaching out to them, meeting them and spending time with them is uh, something that I really enjoy. And I think that natural enthusiasm kind of rubs off on them as well. And, you know, they enjoy the experience too. Mm -hmm. And I think whenever you take somebody's portraits, uh, it's a kind of collaboration between the two of you, really. It's, um, and the more you can spend time with people and understand a little bit about them, you can make a portrait that uh, tells a bit more of a story about who they are. Mm -hmm. and the more that they're relaxed and comfortable being themselves in front of the camera. How would you say the balance is between you making pictures and taking pictures? Um, and by that, I mean, you know, with the fact that you do a lot of lifestyle work, what I found in my own career is that um, sometimes I like to create a situation and then see what comes out of it, and, and you kind of things happen which you weren't expecting to happen, and those are the kind of feel like the most real moments. Um, it totally depends on the story. Obviously, sometimes you're doing editorial assignments and it might be the fact that you just are reactive more than proactive. But then when you do commercial work, you obviously have to recreate those kind of situations and make them seem spontaneous when quite often they're not. Yeah, that's um, that's very true. And I, I work on my lifestyle shoots. I work a similar way. So I'll create a situation as you say and uh, operate a little bit more like a more like a director than a photographer maybe where you, you put the elements in place and you you, uh, you create a uh, you find a location or you create a set that has the look you want you brief your actors or talent or what have you on what you're trying to achieve and talk them through mood boards or whatever else you've put together so they understand what you're trying to do and then I'll coach people and direct people as we go along and let and but allow for some spontaneity to happen. And it's often those little moments that give you something that feels reasonably authentic and feels reasonably real, even when you're a team of 20 people and no one's met each other before that morning. You mm -hmm. can create something that feels, um, that feels like a real moment, which is usually what our clients are after. Mm. Um, the challenge comes with, doing that to a brief, working through a shop list and a timetable with a client and an art director and having the time to let those moments happen. And that's when I think the pressure's on as a, as a photographer, you, you, earn your, you earn your beans um, when you've got to deliver on a, on a, you know, when not everything's maybe working your way. And through your kind of experience with photography over the years, have you got kind of moments that you can share that have kind of times when something um, has perhaps not worked out or alternatively worked out really well that you weren't expecting to? Um, I, I guess for our listeners, it'd be interesting to get, you know, uh, anecdotes and real life experiences, learning experiences that you might have had over your career. Um. Yeah, I've got one or two, I think. Um, yeah, I, I've definitely done, luckily only once, I've done the uh, I've done the thing we all dread, which is uh, format the memory card before you've backed it up. <laughs> just, luckily, just, one, 
just once. Yeah, luckily that was um, fairly early in my career on a, on a travel magazine assignment and uh, to Vienna. And, um, and the, the very last memory card of the day, I'd, uh, I'd shot during the day and then got straight on the plane and flown back to London. And so I'd broken up my routine where normally I'd back up the images at the end of each day and for whatever reason. And I, I had a, sh a shoot the very next day and I just picked up the camera, formatted the card, started shooting. I was like, oh, crap, I've lost the entire last day's shoot in Vienna. Luckily, the deadline for delivering the pictures to the magazine wasn't for another 10 days because the art director was on holiday. So I booked myself a cheap flight back to Vienna, just flew back and reshot the last day. But, <laughs> that, um, that my friend so, now it's and, done. No, and nobody needed to know anything different. There we so, go. Um, so what was your takeaway from that? Never break um, your routine? Yeah, keep your discipline. Keep your routines. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, don't get distracted. Um, so I think so obviously they, you are uh, quite well versed at dealing with the problems. Like you said earlier, we're, we, you know, one of the main things we deal with as being photographers is, is dealing with problems. When you, because you, you're, you're quite unique, I think many photographers will just add to their portfolio as they shoot. So they don't tend to do huge, great overhauls. I know some people do, but obviously you, you said yourself, you do big refreshes. So you go out and you'll go and do a series of images in LA, for example, um, how many setups or kind of shots would you kind of hope to get from that sort of thing? Because obviously when I update my portfolio, I'm going, oh yeah, that's a good shot. That'll go in and that'll slot in between these two images. Whereas you obviously kind of go, right, that half of the book's good, but this half is no longer what I want to shoot. So I'm going to go and shoot a quarter of a new book or a half a new book or a complete new book altogether. And then when it comes to, you know, when it comes to producing that, that, that must be obviously hugely time intensive. Yeah, so the way I kind of think about that is, um, like a lot of photographers, we're never 100% we're never happy with our work, right? You look through things and you're kind of like, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's okay, but it's, you know, that's, I'm not 100% that that's, that's as good as it should be or as good as it could be. Sure. And, um, and I do that all the time with my, portfolio or my, my I th work and I think we all do that <laughs> yeah Definitely. um and I suppose so uh I organize these shoots to, to try and do something about it mm -hmm. um so I'll think of uh so the first thing I think about is like well what's the kind of work I want to be able to show so you know the old adage you know show what you want to shoot is mm -hmm. uh is very true um, so if you want to get hired for a particular kind of work, you want to be able to show that you can deliver that kind of work. So I'll plan around what kind of work I want to do. And um, so for the last couple of years in my own work, that's meant perhaps moving a little bit beyond the very commercial lifestyle work that I uh, often get hired for. I'm trying to move a little bit more into uh, where lifestyle starts to meet fashion and sports and more um, aesthetically interesting uh, parts of, uh, of lifestyle photography, from, uh, interesting for me at least anyway. So I've tried, wanted to organize things around that. And I'm the kind of person who finds it hard to do those kind of things here in the UK because yeah. I find I get distracted with ongoing things. Um, I find trying to organize like one shoot around, say I want to do a, a, a car based lifestyle shoot and you kind of think well that will take me a few days to organize and then in the UK you're always worried if the weather's going to work out on the day and always. trying to find locations <laughs> and all that kind of thing. So um, and maybe again it's part of my background, I'm kind of, I like to just have a project that I focus on and it's like well okay well let's just block a week out in the diary Mm -hmm. I'll contact a producer somewhere in the world that I think has the right combination of locations and talent to make something like that happen. And then I'll just go out and shoot six, seven stories in one go. Mm -hmm. Bang, 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 bang. And treat it like my own big photo shoot. Sure. And uh, obviously you need to manage the budget on these things. And I, you know, I don't have the budget that clients do when uh, they're spending their marketing uh, budgets. But... Uh, you can do things uh, surprisingly cost-effectively um, if you're a little bit clever about how you go about it. Mm -hmm. Working with 
local fixers who can help you find locations and find talent, uh, work with local model agencies where, you, where uh, the models are working on a test basis, uh, so you're not having to pay for talent. Um, likewise with hair and makeup, and then collaborating with stylists or uh, my wife also helps me uh, style and art direct my shoots as well, uh, which is uh, a great help. Mm -hmm. um, and you can put together a, a series of shoots that you want to do. So I usually try and plan around doing five, six, or seven shoots over the course of a week. Mm -hmm. um, and for each shoot, I only need to get six or eight or maybe ten interesting pictures out of it, mm -hmm. because I'm never going to show more than that in one go on a shoot. Sure. Um, and I, I tend to think of these things in terms of stories rather than individual portfolio images. Um, I think on my, on my website I have all my sort of uh, shoots and projects laid out, but, and I show just one picture from each, but you, you click through and you see the whole story and you'll see ten photos. And I want to be able to produce that ten photo story mm -hmm. um, and so I'll, I'll plan some subjects that I want to shoot so I, I know I want to do a, a car based shoot or I know I want to do an athletics based shoot or I know I want to do a swimming shoot or whatever it is um, and I'll start reaching out I'll look for uh, wherever I can I'll look for real people to be in some of these things so if you want to do a motorbike shoot find a real biker Mm -hmm. yeah, you can't really fake these things. Sure. Um, if you want to do an athletic shoot, find a real athlete or whatever it is. And <clears throat> then they can often suggest locations because they know where they do these things. Um, and you can pull a small team together to help you do that. Have a local fixer who can drive you around and knows, knows the lay of the land out there and can help you with some local contacts. And then put a schedule together and you just, yeah, you fly out, you recce a few locations, you make a few decisions and you just go ahead and shoot it all. And um, get, uh, I put, you know, put together mood boards, uh, have ideas for stories that I want to shoot, and uh, obviously work through a bit of a budget to make sure it's not getting the budget isn't spiraling out of control, and mm -hmm. uh, and then go go ahead and, and, and shoot it. And inevitably, some stories end up a bit stronger than others. You have your favourites, um, but I find it's a great way to produce a lot of new content in a relatively short amount of time, a relatively cost-effective way of doing it. And you get to shoot the stuff that you actually want to shoot without being constrained by an art director or a client that's got a very specific um, message they need their photo to shoot. You can shoot stuff that feels more spontaneous and more mm -hmm. fun. And that tends to be the kind of stuff that gets you, that gets you hired for the commercial shoots, I find. So when I meet with art directors, and other commissioners of photography, they're not. They're, they often have very little interest in the stuff I've shot for other clients. Sure, they love seeing all the stuff you've shot for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, my printed portfolio is entirely personal work, mm -hmm. um, and I just have thumbnails of commissions at the back, just so I've, that people understand I've, that I can deliver a big commercial shoot. I've got the exact same exact same thing. No one tends to care really when you kind of go oh right yeah that's what that's what an advertising shoot looks like what show me your personal work and that's all people tend to to kind of want to see really which is totally. which is wonderful for us obviously because we can really kind of show the passion and kind of really tell the stories that go along with the images and you know hopefully that kind of makes them feel that we're a bit more passionate and kind of you know really kind of driven by our own personal work yeah yeah Okay. Do you, um, did you find the balance changed, um, you know, from when you started out in terms of how much you were working versus how much you were kind of really, I guess, in production for these kind of test shoots? Um, I think because a lot of photographers, when they're early on in their careers, if they come out of, say, university and they've studied photography and they go into it, you know, they, they're not going to be earning the big bucks on jobs so they need to be working more regularly which is a bit of a catch-22 because it doesn't necessarily then give you the time to be planning and shooting these kind of bigger projects perhaps yeah that's true and i think maybe that's um there are lots of things you can shoot that don't cost very much money mm. and that's kind of the other kinds of projects that i shoot so um so i do, I do, do these big sort of lifestyle test shoots and portfolio refreshes um the other kind of things I do, uh, I, I shoot my own little projects here in London, 
which cost me very little. Um, and if, uh, there's three of those really that uh, come to mind that I've shot over the last several years. The first one I did was uh, called Handmade London. And back in 2012, 2013, I um, started photographing the, the maker scene in London. I, li I like to think it was before everybody else started photographing it. It's now uh, pretty well covered. But, um, and it was an opportunity to shoot something quite different to the way I used to shoot. So, in fact, I shoot very differently now. It's still up on my website, and I'm still proud of the work, but it's a very different aesthetic to the way I shoot now. Mm. Um, but uh, I wanted to do a shoot where I, instead of shooting around a subject and you know, sh sh going and meeting somebody and shooting 100 frames or 200 frames and picking one, I wanted to make just one great picture. And I was very much inspired at the time by um, an American photographer called Chris Chrisman, mm -hmm. who is a fantastic photographer, but uh, and shoots very uh, structured, very highly composed, very highly retouched, and often heavily composited photographs. Sure. And at the time, I think I wanted to do that a to sort of stretch my self aesthetically and b technically as well. And. I was thinking of subjects I could use uh, that I could shoot that technique here in London. And I worked at the time, I had a, a studio that I shared with a few friends that was in a uh, in Shacklewell Lane that was occupied by a whole bunch of different creative and sort of maker type businesses. And I thought, well, I'll start there mm -hmm. because these people work in interesting spaces. I wanted to make a series of environmental portraits. They were all beautifully lit, beautifully composed, and where I made a single photograph of each person. Mm -hmm. And so I started off with uh, a couple that were in my own building, and uh, and one of them was a friend of mine. And I thought, well, this is a good way to start, because I'll start with the friend, because if, if I don't end up with anything at the end of it, like no one's lost any face. So sure. I said, this is quite experimental. So um, I made a photograph of Naomi Paul, who's a lighting designer, and. Um, I, we went to her studio, we arranged one or two things just to sort of tidy up the clutter a little bit to get it a little more uh, aesthetically pleasing. Um, I composed a shot, um, locked off the camera on the tripod, lit, it, lit up the space, uh, made the photograph, made lots of plates to, for little different elements that I wanted in the scene, and uh, spent the next day trying to work out how to put it all together in Photoshop because my skills weren't very good back then. <laughs> um, so it was a great learning curve for me and I learned how to shoot plates uh, properly so that mm -hmm. you don't give yourself lots of work in post-production and produced a sort of these slightly hyper-real photographs of people at work. Mm. And I went on to shoot about 25 people in that style and then I got one of them uh, one of the people I photographed was uh, a guy called Simon Good at the London Centre for Book Arts on Fish Island. And then I got him to hand print a book of the photographs for me, which I used as a promo that I sent out. And in fact, uh, the, uh, the pictures were sent out one by one. Uh, I, I posted people the cover, which was mm -hmm. uh, letterpress printed by Simon, uh, to a design that was made by a friend of mine. And then the individual pages were mailed out and you built the book yourself. So you got to do something handmade in London as well as part of the story. And, Very nice. Very nice. Uh, and it yeah, was a big hit. Um, I made about 150 of these little books and mailed out about 120 and kept the rest for myself. And, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was a big hit. Uh, I got some great commissions off the back of it. Uh, I made some great connections in the sort of artisan and maker scene in London, and it was the first time I'd done a personal project that directly filtered through to my commercial career, and that had earned me some very well-paid commissions. In fact, one of the jobs I got off the back of that is still the highest paid single day of shooting that I've ever done in my career. And, Wonderful. Um, so that was that was really informative for me, the fact that, that mm -hmm. I could do something that was super interesting for me to do, but it directly translated through to commercial assignments. Um, but it, I think the third thing it taught me was that you have to, it's one thing to shoot it, but you've also got to deliver the work and get it in front of people who hire photographers. Mm -hmm. And how you deliver that work is important. And 
in hindsight, I spent too much money on the, on the, uh, on the production of these books. But they were beautiful, and they really got noticed. Everybody mm -hmm. commented on just how beautiful these things were, how they waited for the next page to arrive each week. Um, and I think a lot of people still talk about that project now when I, when I meet them. And I shot that seven years ago. And really? That was, that was seven years ago? Wow. Mm, my style has moved on since then a lot. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, my, my style now is very, tries to be very natural and um, very uncontrived. But, um, uh, but people still talk about Handmade London. Yeah. Do you, um, this is interesting because you touched on a few interesting points there. And one of them, I think, uh, again, that would be interesting for the listeners is the sense that actually a personal project isn't just about producing the end result work. It's also a learning process. It's the fact that you said that, you know, you learned how to shoot better plates, for example, which is something we have to do quite a lot in commercial work. And, you know, to, to be able to kind of put you, force yourself to do something that's creatively um, challenging, as well as actually producing some work at the end of it. And also thinking not just about the image, but about the end delivery and how you then think of creative ways to market it. I think that's that's a really good point and worth people taking on board. How do you do you keep, um, you know, wh where do ideas come to you from and how do you do you note them down? I mean, I know personally I, I, I keep kind of lists and various notebooks and on my phone of things and ideas that come to me and then I'll slowly uh, start to investigate them and perhaps research them and see if they can make them into a reality. Um, what's your kind of a, a, approach to that? Yeah, I, I very much do the same thing. Um, you never quite know when different ideas come to you and I keep notes on my phone and sometimes scribble them in a notebook, um, more and more on the phone these days, uh, just so that you can actually find them again later. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll keep a little list of ideas as they come to me, and then you'll find that certain ideas have a bit more traction than others, and you start to flesh out, well, what might that really look like, and maybe you start to research a few things that you could shoot around it. And then, you know, for every ten ideas you have, maybe only one of them really comes to fruition, because suddenly, the elements come into place, suddenly you've got a bit of time to do it, you've got access to the right kind of subject to start it, maybe, um, and suddenly you're, you're off, and, off and running. Um, they needn't be complicated ideas either, I think that's what is important for people to understand. I mean, um, I was looking earlier this morning actually at um, uh, one, one of the things I use to get inspiration sometimes is a few of the, uh, uh, I have a quite a big photography book collection, and when I time permitting, I quite like to have a coffee in the morning and kind of go through some of the books on the shelf and kind of bring them down. And it's a real luxury to kind of look through them. And one of the books that I love to look at is a Magnum photo book, which is basically a catalog of it's uh, by Fred Richin and uh, Carol Nagger. We'll, we'll put a, a link to this in the show notes. Um, it's a, it's a great kind of collection of the photo books that Magnum put together over the years. And it's got the scans of the layouts and a bit of blurb about them and how they came about. And it's fascinating because it's a really good way to see what other people have, what's gone before, but all in one book. And um, in there they had, uh, I think it's, is it Philip Halsman who photographed a project in, I think the book came out in 1959. It's just called Jump Book. And it was literally every time he took a portrait of somebody he would get them to jump um, at the end and take a picture make a picture and because he was photographing you know celebrities of the day he ended up with this amassed this really interesting book of images of people jumping and um you know the fate i don't know that one of the pictures you might be familiar with is a famous one of dali where he's kind of jumping and there's three cats in the air and water flying around yeah it's an amazing that. photograph Mm. Yeah, and and it came out of that project. Um, apparently, it took twenty eight tries to get that, and it's quite funny if you see the contact sheets because there's <laughs> these poor cats being thrown around. Um, yeah, it's it's good, but he always loved the idea of jumping because he said, you know, at the moment that the the subject jumped, that's all that they could think about. And um, I had to kind of turn off the fact that in my head it made me think of. Um, not sure if you ever saw Charlie Brooker's Nathan Barley years ago but there was a there was a photographer in inverted commas in that series and in that sitcom where he um 
photograph people in the in urinating because at the moment of <laughs> urination <laughs> they truly <laughs> revealed themselves but what i loved about it is the fact that it is it's such a simple idea you know i'm just going to get people to jump take a photo and sometimes the concepts needn't be that complicated um something as simple as that can if you pursue it for long enough actually create an interesting body of work and obviously it depends on the type of photography you are i mean if i went off and did a series of people jumping it wouldn't necessarily suit the other images in my portfolio <laughs> but you have to find something that works for you but it, it doesn't need to be a big idea and I think that's kind of interesting now you know given what we're going through to be you know there are some interesting projects which people are shooting just you know being isolated as um, an art director I know Johnny Hughes who's been doing a, a lovely series of portraits of people that they're kind of through their front doors you know families kind of trapped in their houses and he's just going on his daily exercise walk and kind of taking these portraits of his neighbors um i think there's another photographer Mat matthias zwick i'm not sure how to say his name but again i'm trying to link to it down below um he's doing a series of self-portraits of him at home in his hazmat suit but they're almost like something gregory crudson would shoot you know they're 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 really well thought out and atmospheric images um so, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see how creativity can come out of these moments which actually seem quite doom and gloom. Yet at the same time, I also think it's important that people don't put too much pressure on themselves to actually be producing if they're just not in the right frame of mind to do it. And that's always, I guess this links back to what we were talking about earlier as well and, and what I wanted to get to the nub of, because there are times in our careers where it, it is a roller coaster you go through moments when you're incredibly productive and busy and other moments when actually you get tired and you get a little bit jaded and you get a little bit kind of disinterested in what you're doing and every photographer I know goes through them not everyone likes to talk about it but everyone goes through them and it's interesting to find what people's ways of perhaps tackling that are uh, you know understanding that that's what's happening and finding ways to kind of push themselves through it. Do you have any kind of advice on that from your own experiences? Um, yeah, it's a good question. It's uh, it's definitely uh, a truism that that is that is what a career in photography can be like a little bit. You go through periods of uh, when often often when you're busy, when you have uh, a lot of self confidence, you feel your 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 work is good and everything's on track and then you can suddenly find that you're in a space where maybe you're a little bit quieter and you start looking through your work and you kind of think, God, everything I do is crap. And this can be really hard to, to motivate yourself to do something new about it. And I don't think I've got any magic bullets for that. Um, you've just got to, um, you know, maybe that's the time that you start looking through that list of ideas that you've been keeping on your phone and start to think about, well, you know, when I'm ready, what's, the, what's something that I can shoot that's, that's uh, you know, and they don't need to be big ideas that, you know, shoot things that are, I'm a big believer in shooting things that are, that are cheap, shoot things that are close to home, shoot things that are, you know, the, the subject is already presented the way you want to photograph it, it doesn't need styling and props and studios and all that sort of stuff, shoot things that already look the way you want them to look. Um, and uh, just get out there and shoot stuff and, um, you know, see, see what happens. Am I right in understanding that you shoot um, uh, quite a lot of personal work on film? That's right. Yeah, I do. Um, do you find that so kind of uh, motivates you in a different way, perhaps, sometimes to, you know, pick up a different camera is going to give you a different approach? You know, if you're going out and you're shooting something on a 5.4 or you're shooting something on 35 mil, it's, it, it kind of it forces you to think differently and to work differently. Yeah, definitely. I, I shoot a lot of my portraiture, my personal work that's more sort of portrait related on, uh, on film cameras. Um, and I think I enjoy doing that for two reasons. One is the process that we talked about, the fact that it slows you right down. And, you know, I do lifestyle shoots where I might shoot 5,000 frames in a day on a, on a digital camera. So it's, really refreshing to go and spend a couple of hours making a portrait with somebody and I might just shoot 12, you know, one roll of 120 and have 12 frames at the end of it. 
and that's and you, you know you want to make every shot interesting and potential uh, select and that's uh, just a really nice way of slowing down thinking before you shoot and all that kind of thing secondly I think it's nice because it strips everything back um, on commercial shoots you're working with a big team of people there might be lots of lighting and all that sort of stuff and it's quite refreshing just to turn up with a camera, a tripod, and nothing else, and it's and maybe a reflector, and uh, you know, getting right back to basics, and just saying, right, well, let's look for where the light's nice, and all that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. and thirdly, I think shooting on a film camera in this day and age, it's a very different process for the subject as well, and I think that's important for portraiture or things. Um, I suppose I, I shoot stuff that's not necessarily portraits either, they're kind of people at work doing things, but there is a slower kind of photography to the kind of lifestyle photography that I do for work often. And mm. it's nice, the fact that they can't see what you're shooting. And mm. they, they have to place a lot more trust in the photographer again. Um, and I like that, the fact that I'm not feeling under pressure to show them pictures. I'm not feeling under pressure to portray them in the way that I think that they want to look. I can show something how it is and how I want it to look. And no one's going to does see that, the pictures for a week. And that's does that great. take a, uh, sorry, does that take a lot of pressure off you? You kind of, it, it must also kind of just have a, just a nicer vibe. Uh, on the shoot because you know the uh, we've all done it we we show someone a picture of them on the back of the camera and because you know most people aren't horribly narcissistic they go oh no I don't like that that's a that's an awful picture and you kind of go well actually the picture's fine it's that you don't like yourself if you're, obviously, <laughs> you're not then obviously having to show them any images yeah. probably just doesn't you never have that moment exactly and I think that's a big thing when you're photographing people who um who aren't used to being in front of the camera. A lot of the people I photograph are, are, are real people, as we call them. Um, I, you know, they don't work in the industry. And, um, and not used to seeing themselves uh, on, uh, in photographs except for sort of family snapshots. Then, yeah, I like to take that pressure away of not trying to have to please them. And sure. uh, I can just worry about getting a photograph that tells the story I want to tell about them. Mm -hmm. and that's a really nice way to work, yeah. And also, I think you stay much more engaged with your subject as well, because you're not constantly looking at the back of the screen or looking at the computer after you've done a shot and thinking, oh, should, it, should we try something? Should we just change the position of something and shoot it again? Instead, you're, mm -hmm. you're talking to them the whole time because you're not staring at the back of your camera half the shoot. So I think that's important as well. You keep them engaged much more. That's good. Do you, do you find in the in the kind of the world of instant gratification that people are almost shocked that they might have to wait to see the images? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't tell people that I'm shooting things on a film camera. Uh, mm -hmm. I just turn up, and then usually they're sometimes they're uh, surprised. You, you always get the question like, oh, "Can you still get film for those things or whatever?" Um, <laughs> and then. Um, and some people take a great interest in it, and some people just couldn't care less. It's just a camera to them, and it sure. makes no difference. So, um, but and then yeah, when I tell them, it will probably be a couple of weeks before they see the pictures. Um, mm -hmm. Most people are pretty cool with that. I think if it was a digital shoot, we'd still probably tell people it would be a week before they saw any pictures anyway, because I'd want the time to uh, edit the photos and uh, and that sort of thing. So sure, that's kind of fine, and that's part of what's nice about. Uh, shooting on a film camera as well as just the fact that you, you, you've only got 24 shots to look through when you develop your two rolls of film or whatever. So you're not having to do some massive edit of 500 photos for a portrait session. You've, you've got 24 yeah. photos to look through. It's an awful lot easier to pick your favorite two or three. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. It saves you a huge amount of time as well. Mm. Yeah. With it, obviously, the subject doesn't care what you what you shoot the images on. They, they literally couldn't be... Couldn't be any more interested. Probably, I very rarely ever get um, ever get questions from the subjects about my camera gear. Um, but I think it's obviously, you know, I think it would be rather amiss. You know, photographers obviously do care about equipment to a certain level. 
you know, is there is there something that you have ever found that you've you've really loved shooting on, or something you'd love to shoot on more, or something that's a kind of a really unusual shooting experience that kind of makes the the personal work more enjoyable? Or yeah, I think um, for me that's part of the joy of um, shooting on old medium format cameras, is they're just such mm-hmm. beautifully made mechanical instruments that are just a pleasure to to use and uh, you know when with a wonderful shutter sound. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, when you're, um, you know, when you're taking a, a portrait on a, on an old Hasselblad or or something, it's uh, you know, there's something really nice about the whole process of it, and mm-hmm. uh, it's a bit more magic look- to it. The sense that you've got this kind of box in your hand that's literally capturing a moment in time, rather than something that can just go. Grrr. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're making very deliberate choices about when you press the shutter button. Yeah, mm-hmm. and what's in the frame when you do so, and. Uh, um, I heard a great uh, quote the other day. I was watching one of the negative feedback uh, YouTube videos, and um, and uh, the host George Muncy was saying, uh, if there was a laser eye surgery that could give you an operation to make the world look like what it does through the ground glass of a Hasselblad, I'd be the first person to sign up. <laughs> And uh, I thought that was a wonderful thing. Yeah, when you, when you look through that, just everything looks photographable. Everything looks beautiful. And uh, mm. it's having a nice had way laser to work. surgery, I uh, I probably wouldn't want to have it again. If I'm <laughs> <honest>. <laughs> um, so, and it's nice to use a variety of different cameras on those kind of things as well. So I have uh, have an old uh, Hasselblad D series that I shot shot all of the Europeans on. I have mm-hmm. a, a Hasselblad uh, H1, which shoots 6.5, that I've shot a lot of my more recent um, uh, London Artisans stuff on. Uh, I have a, a Mamiya 6 that I shoot a lot of my sort of travel, landscape, and documentary stuff on. Uh, I have a, a bunch of Leicas that I shoot a lot of my... Uh, I don't really use them for sort of personal projects, but I use them just for my own personal photography, some of which mm-hmm. makes it onto my website. Um, and, I mean, we, uh, we actually, I mean, myself and Greg, we both shoot with Leicas for that exact reason as well. I mean, I use them for my, well, I think we both actually use them for our work as well. But for me, there is just something about, you know, that the, there is a certain amount of character that you get. And of that, that for me, for documenting my life in general, is definitely, I, I definitely want to look back in, you know, 50, 60, well, or 20 years, depends on how well I do. Uh, I want to look back and just be like, yeah, they were. That was a lovely time. I just I feel the photos that come from from my likers just have that that kind of I don't know that je ne sais quoi, if you will. Yeah, it's a lovely way to shoot for sure, and a lovely way mm. to uh, collect memories of your life along the way. And um, you all... I, I've started I've started trying to um, bring some of using some of these other cameras into my into my work as well, actually. And um, so actually, out in LA, I took out. Um, uh, I have a couple of Pentax 6.7s, so I took one of those out to Los Angeles with me, and uh, and an Instax Square as well. And if you look at some of the shoots from LA on my website, you'll see that actually there's, a, there's some stuff that's shot on a 5D, some stuff that's shot on a 6.7, and some stuff that's shot on an Instax, and they're kind of all blending in together into one story, and I kind of like that way of being able to use I different some tools of the and combine bike. on the same shoot. Yeah, so that was yeah, the motorbike shoot. shoot. Mm. And a, on the, there's a few, uh, the few instacks on that, isn't there? Yeah. Mm. And on the, the rooftop shoot as well, there's uh, there's instax and uh, pentax six seven stuff on there as well. And it's nice to be able to mix those things together. <clears throat> Is there any particular challenges you found with blending them to make them look kind of a part of the same set, or have you never really kind of come across that? Um, well, instax is always going to look different, of course. <laughs> there's no uh, sure. Yeah. Um, but it's but that kind of lo-fi aesthetic is uh, is quite current at the moment, and it's a nice way to shoot it rather than trying to fake it in Photoshop. Why not just use the real thing? Mm-hmm. Um, and shooting on the on the Pentax, um, obviously, it's a big, heavy manual focus camera, so you you need to set up shots uh, rather more than you would with a five D and autofocus and seven frames a second or whatever it is. So, but uh, 
for the sort of lifestyle portraits that I like to do. I, I kind of shoot portraiture and lifestyle, and I try to blend them together on shoots and do a bit of both. And for lifestyle portraits, it's a, a Pentex is a lovely thing to shoot on, and it has an aesthetic that is that is different to shooting on a 35 millimeter digital. Mm -hmm. um, and you also get uh, you also get wonderful colours from from the film shooting on Portra 160 or Portra 400. You get these fantastic colours, which I still find very hard to uh, get that aesthetic on my digital files. Which sure. have these really pleasing colour palettes. Mm -hmm. So I guess I mean it'd be I'd love to be able to chat to you all day, Jules. I mean it's been really informative to kind of get that sense from you from somebody who's working in the industry and has got as much experience as you have. Um, there's a few kind of ongoing questions that we like to ask. Um, and I guess one of them, so one of them would be, we'd like to hear what your favorite photo book is. One of them, we'd love to hear what your desert island camera is. And the last one would be just a kind of thought on where you think the future of the industry is perhaps going, which could be as long or as short as you want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's an easy question to finish up. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> an open-ended yeah. one, that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, favourite photo book. Um, luckily, you gave me some warning about this one, so I had a chance to browse my own bookshelf and have a little think about that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm going to have to pick one of, the, of, of two here, which I think... Uh, the first is William Eggleston's Guide, which I think is a wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, mm -hmm. um, his way of finding humor in little everyday moments is exceptional and uh, a real inspiration to me. And the second one that I love is Stephen Shaw's Uncommon Places. And again, he finds that beauty in the everyday, but in a very different way, you know, shooting on a giant view camera. Um, and uh, just finding these beautifully aesthetically balanced compositions of a car park or a supermarket mall or what have you. Um, and if I had to keep one with me on my desert island, it would probably be William Eggleston's Guide, I think, just because that sense of humor would cheer me up when I, when I needed it. And um, if I could only one, grab one camera when, uh, from the fire, I think it would be... Uh, my Leica M3, with a, and I have an old Canon 50mm 1.2 thread mount lens for it. And uh, I think the reason for that would be, it's, uh, I mean, it's, the camera is 60 years old already, and it's still the most, the finest feeling camera that I own. It's mm -hmm. so smooth and, and so beautifully made, uh, and it produces, uh, and the lens as well is still uh, pristine and feels like they were made last year, not 60 years ago. Sure. And, and obviously the, no no batteries, no no TTL, no meter, nothing. Yeah, you can just pick it up and shoot no matter what. And About as pure as it uh, gets. Yeah, and the feel of shooting with it, it just it is wonderful. It just makes you want to go out and find things to take photographs of. So, uh, nice. so yeah, so I think uh, that, would be my, that would be my emergency camera. And then, uh, and then the big one, the future of photography. <laughs> um, well, if, if I knew the answer to that, I'd probably be uh, living in a much bigger house. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, uh, I mean, there's a few trends that have been ongoing for some time now that I think are going to continue for sure, which is that uh, the commodification of imagery, I suppose, um, mm -hmm. that... Uh, more and more imagery is being produced by more and more non-traditional sources, you know, people who wouldn't necessarily call themselves photographers, um, and we get saturated with them all the time. And brands wanting to sort of harness that to get their own messages out there. Sure. Uh, the fact that brands are going to need to produce ever, ever more content to fill all these different channels that they feel they need to have a presence on. And I think as a photographer, it's going to be difficult to fight for quality in what we do and not be pushed down the path of quantity, sure. which you know, we already feel it. And I think that's only going to become more and more prevalent. Mm -hmm. I think obviously and as I, an industry, we probably need to stick stick together quite quite a lot there and make sure that 
clients really do understand that you can have something but you can't have you know it's, it's quality fast and cheap or you know or the, or the the three sliders you know something's got to give if you want yeah. a lot fast it'll be bad quality if you want lots of quality but fast it'll be expensive you know i think i think as photographers we all need to make sure that that no one is starting to undercut unnecessarily and things like that because as soon as all that starts happening it's just a race to the bottom yeah i mean i think you know we can't control you know how everybody runs their business but i think making sure oh, oh, we can, oh, we can. The, the value of uh, <laughs> <laughs> the value of uh, good quality imagery of anyway. course yeah um and trying to find clients who still value high quality mm -hmm. imagery and yeah prepared to pay for it. sure and I, I think the second thing is um you know the technology will continue to change and the aesthetic look uh of style will continue to change and I think you know in the last, in the 15 years that I've been a photographer, the industry has changed massively. With uh, to begin with, it was the adoption of digital, mm -hmm. the switch from film to digital. Secondly, it was uh, when uh, stills cameras started to be able to shoot video, and suddenly we were we were all having to make little films, and, mm -hmm. um, and then that spread out to you know now we have to do gifts and all sorts of things for clients, and learning how to how to shoot those kind of things and how to do them creatively. And I'm sure in the next 10, 15 years, there'll be all sorts of other things that come down the pipeline as technology allows us to create imagery in different ways. Mm. Um, and I think, so that's one thing that's sort of technically driven. And I think a second thing is that the aesthetics will continue to change as well and the mm. way that companies need to tell their stories. And when I... Uh, you know, 15 years ago when I started um, photographing for clients, the, the aesthetic was still very much, uh, advertising was still very much based around aspiration. And you, you photographed dream scenarios that people uh, you know, aspired to be like. And everything, everyone was beautifully manicured and everything was perfectly composed. And, and that's given way, I guess, with the rise of user-generated content and, and uh, smartphones and all the rest of it to now advertising, instead of being aspirational, it tries to be associative. We try to photograph people and people look at that picture and they go, well, that person's just like me. So that's why I should work with this brand and use sure. this brand, whatever. And that's been a massive change. And now it's okay to show people with messy hair. And it's okay to show an unmade bed. And it's okay to do all of these things that 15 years ago you'd never do in an advertising photo. Sure. And, you know, that will change again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know what it's going to be in 10 years' time, but looking out for those pointers as you start to see the, the trend change and being a little bit ahead of the curve and showing that you, you understand that and that that is reflected in your work is always going to be important for photographers and that will continue. Excellent. Well, that incredibly uh, grateful for you coming on today, Jules, because that's been a hugely uh, informative and hopefully our listeners will have some good takeaways from that. So, um, yeah, I think we'd both like to thank you for for getting on board absolutely thank well, you ever thanks. Much. Um, yeah thanks I've, uh, I've enjoyed it too oh perfect yeah. oh well that's good to hear at least it wasn't too painful eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got, got it all off my chest <laughs> <laughs> perfect well Jules thank you ever so much for coming on really really appreciate it and uh, for all the listeners at home obviously go and visit julianlove.com and, uh, and have a look through his fantastic work Okay, guys. Well, I hope that was of interest and you managed to get some good nuggets of information out of that. Thank you for joining us for the first ever episode of The Exposed Negative. If you would like to follow us, you can find us on Instagram at Tom. Our new Instagram handle is xnegative, which is EX negative on Instagram. And meh, that's it, really. Meh, meh, that's it. That's how you want to sign off the first ever <laughs> Exposed Negative. All right, okay, well, well, thanks, guys. Things will <sighs> get better. <laughs> thanks, thanks so much for listening. <sighs> <laughs> uh, we've we've loved doing this one hopefully you guys find it interesting uh we will see you on the next one and uh yeah if you want to ask us any questions or any have anything any suggestions or anything for the podcast please do uh, drop us a message uh, on instagram and yeah we will we'll take it all into consideration but yeah as uh, as greg said <sighs> thanks <laughs>